unfortunate that we have to talk about this at this moment. But one of the things that I, I think uh, it's, it's kind of observable, perhaps a trend in the news in Zimbabwe is that um, this seems to be a reoccurrence of, 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 of what we had under Mugabe. I mean, I don't, I, I, I want to apologize for saying that because I don't want to be so, um, you know, uh, pessimistic about the future of Zimbabwe. But frankly, these are the same kind of attitudes Mugabe exhibited um, during his reign of terror in Zimbabwe. So it it brings into question, um, particularly I'm going to direct it to to the guys on the ground in, in Arari. I think Joy should be in Arari or somewhere in Rua. Right. So Joy. So why do you think this is the new this is the new case in Zimbabwe? I mean, there was so much optimism about the prospect of Nanangagua, and he enjoyed a lot of support from Freedom Loving World, and all of a sudden this this absurdity from his government. So why do you think? This is the new case in Zimbabwe. Why do you think Nangagwa is doing this? You can forgive the world for, for celebrating. I mean, some of us were literally like in the streets, you know. You know, the burden of having to get to get rid of Mugabe was so refreshing. You know, for after about 35 years, you can imagine what it is if an authoritarian dictator has been deposed. Now, I know we should have forced to think how this uh, gentleman ascended uh, into power. And number two, we should have known that, uh, you know, this man has been with Mugabe for, for the past, uh, you know, 50 years or so. So it, it, our, our, we, we, we experience some kind of momentary lapse of attention. But never mind, you know, you, you, you say, uh, you, you point out very clearly that uh, the, 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 world, the international community was, you know, they, they also, you know, what we caught on the guard, they, he was talking about freedom. He was talking about listening to people. Uh, he, he was saying all the nice things that uh, a person who is uh, uh, replacing a dictator would say. But of course, you know, the, the DNA of Zanu Pev by nature, Ibrahim, is non democratic. And we know that uh, in the past uh, 35 or 40 years, Mnangagwa has been associated with the most despicable acts of human rights violations. So we just assume that he has transformed himself, but he hasn't. So it is back to square one with a person that we basically know that uh, is not very, you know, amenable to, to democracy. And, uh, uh, you know, Ed, uh, we're going to talk about it a bit later, the issue of insecurity and low self-esteem, you know, business interests, and all these things are piling onto him and giving a lot of pressure to, to try and, and, and sustain himself. But uh, you know, unfortunately, we're back to square one, Ibrahim, and uh, we 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 are not going anyway. I I try as much as I as I can to to be optimistic about the situation of Zimbabwe, but sometimes you just have to reckon with the facts. And the fact here is that this man is becoming despotic. So I would like to get um, Darren's um, opinion on this because you work as a foreign affairs shadow minister in South Africa, and part of your concern, I guess, is Zimbabwe. And as I asked. Um, rejoice, part of the backbone or one of the major, um, you know, backbone of support in Nangagwa and Joyce now is from the international community, people that are ready to give to Zimbabwe, um, you know, money for, for, them, for the country to invest in, in, in infrastructure to spend on poverty elevation programs. And I guess that Africa is one of the main guarantors of Zimbabwe's uh, or Nangagwa's trust, trustworthiness. But with the new reality, do you think your country can still vouch for Umangagwa? And particularly, you know, um, because your country is the, perhaps the closest um, international ally to, to Zimbabwe. <laughs> Thanks for starting off easy. But I mean, the thing is, if we take, if we go back a step, we would say that exactly the same thing, you know, that uh, for us, when we looked at it, I mean, Ngangwa took over, which was almost a case of the same one, uh, just a different cork. Um, and you want to be optimistic. You know, you want to hope that um, when you're looking for direct foreign investments, that if you're singing a different tune, that that direct foreign investment will come more willingly. And unfortunately for us, it never came more willingly. They were, they, were, they were looking, the direct foreign investments were looking for more guarantees. They were looking for more action and not just words. You know, what, what, how was the land going to, how was the land issue going to be dealt with? 
how uh, was they going to how was the zonu pf going to govern per se and i think one of the fundamental exercises was going to be elections and how are the elections going to be run and uh, we saw you know and i can't say it's just the zonu pf unfortunately it's, it's everyone has to take credibility in the elections and how they behave but uh, the one person that has to take the overall responsibility is how the president behaves and when your election monitors are from overseas they do go back and they do report on what they see and when they go back and they report back to their governments that's where the direct foreign investment is coming from so allies zimbabwe has very few um in fact south africa to a large extent the loyalty in my opinion is very material in that it's it's a, it's a government it's a party to party loyalty if that government changes it's very hard to say that south africa and zimbabwe would be loyal to each other and for for me it's a, it's a case of although we're reliant on each other you know and and uh, our ideological um, partnership at this point in time is dragging us both into the same corridors um you know we we got to we got to at this stage it's not it's going to be based on partner it's, it's allies both in zimbabwe and south africa are going to have to find each other both on the one side of ideology and on the other side of ideology and it's okay so it's, it's it's really a case of people are going to have to reach out in the static areas on ideology there's going to have to be partnerships and alliances on on ideology interesting so pierre let me come to you real quick so one of the um excuses given by nangagwa is that this new crisis in the country is being incited by rogue elements in the opposition party some journalists that are paid by international organizations to to incite violence and promote um you know divisions subdivision in the country so we are journalists and opposition figures the one uh you know promoting violence or what is the truth in this matter Yeah. Thank you very much uh, for that and I, and I'm glad that you raised that uh, right at the outs- at the outset. I I think the basic human rights violations happening in Zimbabwe has been talked about for more than four decades. Uh, and so I want to dispel what uh, Munangagwa has been putting out to his own people through his propaganda machine and out into the world. So let's get the story correct. There is a human rights crisis in Zimbabwe. Now why do I say that? It's important to establish and to specify what is meant on the crisis of human rights violations in Zimbabwe today. So what are the basic rights in what are the basic human rights in Zimbabwe? They are the moral norms, the moral standards that are universally accepted and understood as inalienable fundamental rights of every human being. The right to free speech the right to peacefully assemble the right to freedom of association open and free press the right to a fair trial access to information and many many more and in the case of zimbabwe it's not easy it's not enough to say the country signed a treaty to protect fundamental human rights we need to call a spade a spade the zimbabwean people deserve to know that it is unquestionable that their human rights are protected uh, in practice not just that zimbabwe has signed some treaty somewhere So to answer your question of what constitutes human rights crisis and whether this is a real situation it is the evidence of what international bodies agree to being uh, what they call serious violations for a government to fail to address poverty and inadequate living standards and its citizens it's on its own a violation of human rights i mean there's I, there are more than 10 different types of human rights being abused in 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 Zimbabwe arbitrary arrest and detention deliberate targeting of civilians enforced and involuntary disappearances excessive use of force by police restrictions of movement torture violations of right to life uh so there there are many 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 different types of human rights violations uh happening in Zimbabwe right now what we're seeing in Zimbabwe are not only a gross human rights crisis but a consistent pattern of gross violations of human rights it is a human rights crisis in zimbabwe because abuses don't all, don't only involve a single victim it's a number of breaches happening over a period of time and so these abuses involve an element of planning by state actors 
and a demonstration by a sustained will on the part of the perpetrators. So most of the incidences have an inherently inhuman and degrading uh, type of characteristics, if I may call it that. And I'll end just by saying that Articles 21 and 22 of the International Covenant on Civil and, Pol and Political Rights, the ICCPR, to which Zimbabwe agreed to adhere to, provides for the rights to freedom of peacefully assembly and of association. Yes, there is a human rights crisis in Zimbabwe. You know, certainly there is a human, human rights crisis in the country. But uh, one of the things that I, I'm, I'm trying, to, trying to make our own, um, audience understand is how the whole pandemic or the lockdown frustration contributes to, to this current crisis. And I think one of the um, uh, you know, straw that, bro that broke the, the back of the resolve of the Zimbabwean people was the fact that the lockdown was biting hard. And rejoice, I don't know if I'm correct here, do you think the, the, the COVID-19 lockdown as many ways, uh, you know, in, as in many ways contributed to this whole crisis or, uh, or do you think it's, a, it's an entirely different case on its own? How, how, how do we connect all this, if at all they are connected? Uh, Pearl makes a very good point that uh, we are signatories to all the conventions in the world. But then again, we also have our own almost perfect constitution. So, so with Zanu P.F. Real, uh, Imran, it's not about the, the, the word and the print. It, it's, it's really about their own individuals and their own uh, you know, desire uh, for political survival. So COVID-19 uh, only comes like six or seven or 12 or two years after 20 people had been shot in the streets already. So, so really, I do not even believe that, uh, you know, you know, COVID-19 has added a new dimension uh, to the rights violation. For starters, we all agree uh, as, as, as Zimbabweans that uh, it's not safe to go out uh, willy-nilly, right? But basically, you know, when we come to expression of our individual free freedoms in terms of uh, demonstrating, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, picketing, there are protocols that have been set in place, Ibrahim. You, you, you can demonstrate and picket respectfully, you know, social distancing and using the necessary PPE. So it's not a problem really about, uh, about, about uh, COVID-19. But COVID-19 itself has come in as a very good excuse to increase the leverage of authoritarianism. The while we appreciate the, that COVID can really bring to, uh, to, uh, to the fore certain restrictions, but the arrest of Job Sikala and uh, Ngarubum and Optimono and their denial of bail uh, it shows you that there are more there are, uh, more evil forces that are related to to the restrictions of rights than there are to do with COVID nineteen. So it's, it's it's basically nothing to do with the disease. I mean, so that's going to bring me to my next question for Pierre. So we saw the recent um, denial of bail for um, this this journalist Obochi Chinono. I don't know if you are familiar with the person. And one of the arguments from the the executive is that himself and many other journalists in, in Zimbabwe are promoting what they call um, terrorists, what Mandela refers to as terrorist um, agitations or terrorist activities. So uh, that's one of well, a strong way to, to refer to peaceful protests. And I, I wouldn't say I know exactly what's going on down in Zimbabwe, but what do you think the press is doing wrong or what do you think they are doing right that is getting on Mandela's nerves? And how do you see the press or you know, the, the media and advocates groups you know, being key to resolving this crisis here. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ibrahim. Uh, before I uh, address that question directly, I just wanted to make it clear, abundantly clear, that the ZANU-PF ruling political party, led by Emerson Munangawa, is not unleashing terror on its people for no reason. On the contrary, to make it clear, President Emerson Munangawa has strategic grounds for being repressive. What Munangawa wants is to stop any actions that threaten his power, his vested interests, and what he benefits from corruption. He is arrogant. And it is this arrogance which seeps out of all things on PF, which has brought continued rot to Zimbabwe. So what journalists have been doing uh, has been to, um, to, to hold the, the, his power to account. And that is one function of the fourth estate. For independent, and I want to make it clear, it's independent journalists because he uses the state media as a propaganda machine. 
But as independent journalists, and what uh, Hopewell did, who you so rightly mentioned, was to expose some of that massive corruption. Uh, and, and so when that threatens his power, you see the arrogance come out and seeped out through uh, Zanapiev as well. Because as I've said time and again, Emerson Mnangagwa has conflated his position as president with the state itself. And so the state and him, they see each other as one. And, and that is what we're seeing between Emerson Mnangagwa, Zanapiev, um, and the country. This is a strong indictment on the Mnangagwa government which of course is strongly supported by the South African government, and you are part of the South African government. I'll, maybe not directly, but how do you respond to this allegation of perhaps someone could say, you know, the South African government is supporting a corrupt government in Zimbabwe, and now the whole issue is blowing up in everybody's face. And what, how do you, first of all, how do you respond to the allegation? And second of all, how do you think, if at all, South Africa has a role to play, in what ways do you think your country can can help quench the crisis in, in Zimbabwe? Well, again, you know, the, the, I wear two caps. The one is I, I am a politician in South Africa, but the other one is I'm a politician in SADC. And SADC, you have to appreciate, if I can play devil's advocate, in SADC, there are people that believe that the most successful government has been Robert Mugabe's government in the sense that the most successful president in Africa to, to bring transitional justice was Robert Mugabe. So now, if you take that, if you take that and you say, well, where's the transitional justice and where does it take you? Where's it going to bring you? Um, because if people are suffering and people are starving, um, but you can argue that everyone's got land or people have access to land, um, where do you start seeing the positive benefit? You know, where do you start seeing, as Pearl says, that uh, human rights is a, is an asset as well? And if you don't have human rights, you don't have your assets. You know, you can have land, but if you don't have human rights, you, you're missing an asset. You're missing your assets, or you're missing access to your assets. So now in South Africa, as much as a politician in SADC, I sit on the other side of both of both uh, opinions, in the sense that in South Africa, the ANC believe, the ANC government believe that they have an ally in the ZANU PF government. Um, they supply a lot of, they supply electricity, they have uh, the shared borders. Um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of partnerships in 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 uh, in many uh, in many projects. But the truth is, is that when it comes to diplomacy, South Africa's South Africa's more worried about Morocco. They're more worried about the Middle East. They're more worried about what happens elsewhere than what happens just north of their borders. And they turn a blind eye to what's happening in Zimbabwe, where my concern and my voice has been more concerned about what happens north. And it's not to play judge or jury or, you know, what we've been calling for is just to, to have an honest envoy that goes through to Zimbabwe and sees for themselves. The envoy that uh, President Ramaphosa picked was an insult to Zimbabwe, in my opinion. In, in, in the sense that they had already sided with ZANU PF in, in the previous dispensation, so you've already got a preconceived notion of what you you've almost you could have almost drawn up your own uh, opinion before you even left. So when you go have a tea party with with the president, and the president says, "No, you don't have to go. You, there's nothing you have to see further. You know, we, we tell you everything's fine, so you don't have to come in and see. You can leave now," and they leave. We're now pushing President Ramaphosa, and I've put out press releases to that effect, to say, well, President, you're the, chip, you're the president of the African Union. You're one of the most powerful presidents of the African of the of SADC. And as president of South Africa, we urge you to go to, Zon uh, to Zimbabwe and see for yourself what's taking place. Meet with opposition leaders and meet, most importantly, with people on the ground. And hear what people are saying. Meet with people on all sides of the coin meet with people from all walks of life and hear what everyone is saying and, and form a balanced opinion on the ground and then come back and honestly report. But Darren, do you think um, there is a problem in the fact that uh, maybe the representative from South Africa do not want to work with the MDC, which is the opposition party, particularly considering the fact that um, um, Nangagwa recently said that the MDC has been funded by international 
organizations or foreign governments, perhaps South Africa or some other governments, to um, unseat him or brook violence or or you know crisis in the country. Do you think that's the reason why perhaps the uh, the the Ramaphosa delegation to Zimbabwe is not really working with the opposition, Darren? Well, look, to a large extent, I think South Africa is very arrogant in the sense that I think Zimbabwe is more experienced than South Africa. I think Zimbabwe can tell South Africa where South Africa is heading. Um, I think Zimbabwe can lecture South Africa on where South Africa is about to go. Um, what, 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 what we should learn, and it's going to be a tough lesson, and you talk about COVID, and COVID supplied a lot of negative, but COVID supplied a lot of positive to, to, to parties with nefarious uh, uh, inclinations. Um, leaders that have um, ulterior motives have, have, have uh, plowed ahead in, under the cover and guise of COVID and moved and gained ground. Uh, I've seen that in Zimbabwe. I've seen it in South Africa. And you know, if you've got if you've got these uh, if you've got these um, you know you've got these ideologies, as I spoke about in the beginning, that you're working towards. This is this is the place to this is the place this is COVID is the cover that it's going to pretty much move you towards it. Now, as I say, I don't think we are the experts on it. I think that we're going to learn. I think Zimbabwe have got more of. I think Zimbabwe can teach South Africa more than South Africa can, you know, than South Africa can lecture Zimbabwe. And I think we should be listening more than we should be talking. But um, rejoice. We're still going to be staying on on the issue of the opposition and you know the role of the opposition in all of this crisis. And one of the news I recently um, saw is about the division within the MDC, and I'm wondering if the MDC, the main opposition party, is so divided within itself. So we're going to leave this this challenge against Mangagua. I mean, isn't it supposed to be the opposition party, or are we looking at specific individuals, perhaps maybe outside the political party space, maybe some activists? But primarily, why do you think, or how do you think the MDC, the body within itself, can pose a great challenge to Mangagua, particularly keeping him, you know, um, sane as regards human rights, uh, uh, you know, adherence to human rights? We are going to get a fragmentation of opposing parties. It's, it's going to happen. You know, you, you, you get it in South Africa, there's DA, there's, you know, AFF, there's everybody in there. And, uh, you know, in Zimbabwe, we have, we have accepted the fact that uh, Zanu PF will always have, uh, you know, the leverage to try and divide uh, opposition. They've got the access to national resources. They've got access to huge, huge, huge funding from uh, their chronic capitalists. So it's not going to be, it's not going to come to an end very soon. Now, what, what is necessary now is for MBC Alliance to broaden its front in terms of uh, bringing in civil society into the afford. You know, when the when the bishop started talking, the Catholics and the Anglicans started talking last, last week, it was very clear that uh, uh, the, the way the world reacted to, to, the, to the ecumenical, you know, uh, uh, criticisms, uh, it, it works better if uh, the MBC Alliance reigns in on the critical leverage of the global and popularity, and popularity of, of Mnangagwa. So I, I still feel that, uh, you know, we, we don't have to you know, to, to get uh, you know, sleepless nights about the infiltrations. Because guess what? Uh, the MDCT of Tawazani Kupe, you know, Douglas Monzora and Morgan Komichi have already been associated with Zanu So it's, it's, it's not, it's not going to be difficult to dispatch off these guys in a normal electoral situation. So, so, so Zanu PF can, can get all the leverage it wants through ZPC, the Herald and the, the, the public media. Uh, propping up uh, MBC uh, T, uh, uh, you know, masquerading as if uh, there's a huge fraction uh, in the in the in the opposition, uh, uh, you know, camp. But that's not going to work because the the heart of the people, uh, the the heart of the opposition is in the people. So it's important. The four million people that are citizens that are on the voters roll, Ibrahim, they not they don't necessarily carry the political sway. There's another two or three million people out there who can be able to take up the cause. Uh, for a new dispensation. So while it is it is critically important that opposition unites, uh, but for the purposes of, of dealing with authoritarian governance, it's more important to, to rein in on the leverage of civil society. 
And I'm sure that uh, the leaders of the, uh, of the opposition are aware of that, if I am. So, so, Pierre, I want us to stay on the objectivist side of things here. So, um, don't get me wrong, but I think the MDC had its chance to, to you know, gain political power in Zimbabwe during the election, but Nangagwa emerged. And now people are thinking, okay, so if the MDC um, lost in the election, and now they are at the forefront of, quote unquote, trying to unseat a lawfully elected um, government, don't you think that's a big, um, a big um, stamp against the NDC, some genuity in all of this here? Uh, thanks, uh, Ibrahim. I think um, that's an interesting uh, framing that you, that you put there. So uh, let's tackle this in some detail, okay? Uh, there is no evidence right now that uh, suggests that the MDC lost in the 2018 election. So I want to lay that brickwork as the foundation of my response. There is no evidence of that. Um, there were international election observers at the 2018 election. Uh, the European Union were there as observers. The US were there as observers. And of course, SADC and other uh, observers were there too. And, and none of the international observers, and by this I mean the EU or the US, um, reports state that those elections were not free nor fair. Neither were they credible. Uh, in fact, the, the opposition uh, suggested 2.6 million people voted and that they did in fact win the election. So as, as at the moment, there is no evidence that suggests, uh, and the US government certainly has not put it out there, that Mugabe is in fact legitimate. So there is a legitimacy question, uh, but for let's just suppose I'll play to your to your, to your, to your, to your uh, suggestion that perhaps okay, uh, Nagawa is 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 the leader. He is the person who has the seat. He is the person who resides at the state at the in government right now. So here's another thing: the way a democracy works and the way power works is that power in this case resides and he's given that power by the people. What, Munga, what has happened with Munangagwa is he has lost his social contract. The notion that he is continuously still struggling with that social contract is the very question of his legitimacy. And, and this is why any protest leader, anyone who wants to organize mass protests, should be able to stage mass protests because they can in fact change the status quo in Zimbabwe because the people that decide who they will be governed by, that decision rests with the people. And so the, the, we need to understand the power balances um, in, in Zimbabwe. But let's bring um, a little more balance. I wanted to tackle a little bit of something that uh, Darren talked about in regards to um, SADC and South Africa and, and their position and their role and so on. So one thing I want to um, uh, put out there is uh, Mnangagwa's government agents continue to perpetrate physical and psychological torture on the people of Zimbabwe, okay? So um, the 2019 Human Rights Report even uh, did mention and reported that torture methods, including beating victims with sticks, clubs, tables, gun butts, Shambox, beating the soles of people's feet, and pouring corrosive substances on people to expose their skin. These types of things are happening within Sadiq countries, its own neighbor. These instances are typically done at night. Okay, and the, the, the Sadiq countries, including South Africa, have repeatedly applauded Munangagwa even as he has ramped up increasingly egregious attacks on human rights abuses on his own people. Not a single SADC country has called out the prison and detention conditions, which are harsh and life-threatening due to overcrowding, food shortages, inadequate sanitary conditions, lack of medical care, and now even exposure to coronavirus. These SADC countries have remained silent. So they are complicit. And so, when we talk about South Africa and what South Africa might do and what South Africa's role is, 
Um, the one primary thing that I would um, proffer to this discussion and this debate is that South Africa has to first publicly acknowledge that the whole SADC region is in leaning towards a crisis. And there is growing international disinterest in the leadership of SADC. And any South African leader without clout or needs to come up or with clout rather, who wants to have some influence in the region. This is, I'm speaking directly about Ramaphosa. He needs to have sincere, transparent framework that is inclusive of diverse stakeholders. And I'll say it again, stakeholders must include Zimbabwe's diaspora. At the root of the problem, South Africa has to chart a creative way to broker a resolution of the political impasse between the ruling Zana PF and the Opposition Movement for Democratic Change, the MDC. In parallel, the government of Zimbabwe has to implement speedy political, social, and economic structural reforms that garner increased international support. So if South Africa helps the people of Zimbabwe in, or if it's to help the people of Zimbabwe in a meaningful way, it will be tantamount to admitting to systemic governance failure of liberation movements across SADC and their impunity and sense of entitlement. But South Africa needs to come out and start supporting the people of Zimbabwe. Just to say that, uh, Pearl, I'm 100% behind you. That's exactly what I say. You know, my, my place in SADC is not to uh, clap behind everyone. It's to rather say that there's definitely, and as I said earlier, you know, that SADC's not going to be in the future, can't be in the future about a country being loyal to another country. It's got to be about ideologically challenging that across the countries that you're either going to be for the one side of the ideology or the other side. It's, it's, it's obvious that in the West of Africa and in the East of Africa, they're getting their act together. So the ECOWAS regions, the East uh, African regions, they're building infrastructure that's helping intra-trade in Africa. They're building, an in they're building their own parliaments. They're working with each other. And they're getting to a stage where they're making sure that they're actually, I mean, you can see it's in their growth figures. You can see it in their stability. Um, in fact, the terror problem that the East perpetrated and that uh, has always been a problem that historically affected East Africa, is now moving into South, Southern Africa. Now, when you had the SADC meeting the other day, um, ter the terrorism hardly got even a mention, and Mozambique and Zimbabwe was hardly on the agenda. So we're, I'm with you 100% on this. But what I'm saying is that it's no use worrying about what's inside the country. You know, like Ibrahim spoke about uh, the opposition and what the president is saying about the opposition. And I'm saying it's no use even worrying about that. It's because the external forces are far more important. We can blame the Western countries. We can blame the Eastern countries, which are coming in. And, you know, there's, there's the rumors of, of what really happened with the overthrowing and who really runs these countries and who owns the mines in these countries. And, you know, who owns the economies of, of, of the countries? And, if we've come out of the colonization from the British colonizations, are we going into Chinese or Russian colonization now? You know, and the, the sadic story is always, a, you know, we just, you don't want to repeat the history and go into another uh, terrible history of our own. But we're now looking at the weakest region of Africa being sadic, which was once the shining beacon of Africa, the, the beacon of hope, is now looking like the darkest, darkest region of Africa. And we're looking at a, you know, where I said Zimbabwe can teach South Africa on a lesson about where South Africa is about to pull South Africa. And it's not, it's not a new ideology. It's an ideology that South Africa, well, that the ANC created in 1976, that it's been pushing under a guise of, of freedom and fairness, but it's really the National Democratic Revolution. And Zimbabwe has perfected it. South Africa has still got to get there. The rest of the SADC regions, Malawi's, Malawi's uh, 
pulling itself out of it, but now Malawi has 18 hours of load shedding a day. Um, Mozambique's now so entrenched in uh, in battles, the government is calling on the rest of SADC to please just, you know, come help it stabilize. So we're when you talk about a region of SADC, we're so busy internally worrying about X, Y, and Z that there is no mobilization. There is no one, there's no countries that can mobilize because we're, we're all trying to just fix what we can within our own within our own backyards. And as I was saying, I don't think South Africa should be I don't think South Africa should be lecturing anyone. I don't think we're the shining light that should be uh, arrogant enough to be lecturing any other country. I think we should be listening. I think we should be learning from other countries' experiences, especially our countries in Af- in, in in SADC regions. But from my side, as I said, I just believe that now is the time for us to create networks. I think the EFF started it. They've started creating parties and friendships in the rest of SADC. But I think now is the time for other like-minded uh, parties and regions, and not necessarily political parties. I just think friendship organizations to start networking a bit broader and saying, well, I'm in Botswana, I'm in Zimbabwe, I'm in South Africa. Because it's not going to be on the shoulders of journalists alone. Journalists get persecuted. They get thrown into jail. They're not allowed to report. Um, NGOs come in. They, they, they come in. They last six days and then they get thrown out of a country. Mm. But if you start creating networks in different countries and these networks become parties in different regions, in different countries, and you know, then all of a sudden we've got a far greater network, we've got far greater sustainability in all these countries. Say that um, it, it is the external forces uh, who and stakeholders who are going to play a significant role in bringing about this change in, in, in Zimbabwe. Because um, and if we just take a, a minute to think about history for a minute and think back to maybe right around the 1976 era when Forster uh, complied with U.S. pressure to close down the border, uh, the Bybridge border. So Ian Smith was pressured into changing his behavior. And that eventually brought about change. The question now is, for instance, who are those international players who would be able to broker pressure enough for South Africa to apply pressure on on Zimbabwe? And so shutting down that border, for instance, at the Bybridge is the stick we keep talking about carrot stick things that we should be able to use. We need a bigger stick to change behavior in Zimbabwe because we are dealing with a government that is run by the military. And I think shutting down that border is a significantly huge stick. The question is, will the international community, such as the United States, such as the EU, willing to apply enough pressure on Ramaphosa. And if they can't apply on Ramaphosa, then like Darren's, to Darren's point, we need other networks who can apply that pressure, foreign journalists like myself included, including the diaspora. But we need sufficient pressure so that we have a bigger stick to shut down the Bybridge border. That will need to get Nangagwa to start thinking real hard about how he, about his own survival. So, so rejoice, you heard what Peel said. And I think, well, Perhaps one common thing between Pierce and Darren's suggestion is about more international pressure, perhaps sanctions. And personally, I do have my reservations um, as we get sanctioned. I don't know if you agree with, with both of them. Rejoice. Do you think um, sort of, you know, these sort of these sort of ideas like uh, putting more pressure on Nangagwa, um, diplomatic pressure or perhaps sanction are the best way to go to make sure he, he do the right thing, rejoice, or do you think there is perhaps another internal um, dimension or alternative to, to making him get some sense, rejoice? Well, look, there's no production in Zimbabwe. You know, the, this whole cabinet crisis, the prime is decimated industry. And uh, you can imagine that uh, even uh, what, what it takes to just cross the border into South Africa, you, you spend hours and hours because there's so much congestion. There is absolutely no way that border can be closed uh, without the average person suffering. So it's why this it, it looks very you know uh, it looks very romantic and practical on paper. Uh, I think the Rhodesian circumstances are slightly different. Remember, Rhodesia was kind of like self-sufficient. So here, if we are talking about a uh, global, I, I think Darren puts it uh, in a way that is perhaps more more interesting. He talks about global networks 
uh, rather than direct hits onto the. Because remember that the Zimbabweans have to be able to survive the next day to be able to say out their their, their rights. So uh, I'm not going to, uh, you know, engage myself into the into the debate of sanctions or no sanctions. What what I'm, what, what what I strongly feel that it is possible to put pressure on. Because remember, these cronies are very wealthy. They can do their shopping in any part of the world. They, they can do online deliveries. So at the end of the day, even if you share the the, the, bed, the border post, it's going to be the, the villager next door is going to suffer. I mean, these guys are, are stocked up so well, Ibrahim, that they, they can, you can close the border for two years and they're, they're never going to feel it. You know, they've got solar systems, they've got boreholes, they've got, uh, you know, uh, DSTV. So they're not going to suffer. So it's important to, to, to get the, the, the world to, to, to create some turbulence around delegitimizing uh, the, the whole governance process so that at least uh, you know these 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 cronies have nowhere to spend their stolen uh, their, their stolen money uh, and, and of course it's also uh, on the part of the, the citizens in Zimbabwe they still need to keep evoking their constitutional rights because the constitution is very important in that uh, we can legitimize uh, the struggle uh, by uh, you know falling back on the on our constitutional rights uh, but of course, Ibrahim, you're going, to, you're going to talk about judiciary. I'm going to let you ask, ask the question. But I still strongly feel that uh, closing the border will be choking the average person. And I don't think Zimbabweans, the Zimbabweans are prepared uh, to start for, for the cause. Mm. So just to bring it on now, because we're really out of time, uh, Darren, if you can, in one minute, uh, just give an advice to diplomats like yourself in Zimbabwe, Zimbabwean diplomats. How do you think they can contribute um, efficiently to, you know, bringing down this this fire in, in Zimbabwe and keeping Nangagwa more responsible? Darren, diplomats definitely have to be undiplomatic. They have to talk. They have to tell people what is really going on. Um, they we have to report what's going on on the ground, regardless of how ugly it is or regardless of how pretty it is. Whatever the case may be, we have to talk. We have to tell the truth. We have a duty and an obligation to do so. Thank you. So, Piero, you are a journalist, a season one of that. Uh, at the core of this uprising, if I can refer to you as such, are the journalists. You know, it's unfortunate that, you know, our colleagues are getting detained because they're just speaking the truth or writing about the truth. And you cannot stop talking about the truth. But do you have any advice for journalists at the at the you know, crossfire of all this craziness going on in Zimbabwe, what do you think they should keep doing? What do you think they are perhaps doing wrong that you want, to, want them to improve on? Thanks, Ibrahim. Uh, in terms of journalists, I think independent journalists uh, are the fourth estate. Uh, we are the key element of a healthy democracy. And so it is important for us to continue to call out and to hold truth to power. Um, and, and, and this does not exclude the international community. It's not just about writing stories and investigating uh, just only about um, the authorities inside Zimbabwe, but we also need to hold the international community uh, to, to account. Because one thing that I have found in the international community and in international bodies is that these actors frequently use modifiers to describe how bad human rights violations are in Zimbabwe. They'll say things like gross or grave. Are they flagrant or particularly serious? Or are they egregious? And so the key players will be uh, uh, independent journalists um, because the international, what the international community needs to do is to have conviction. The conviction to be the impactful partners of democracy that millions of Democrats in Zimbabwe and its diaspora have been yearning for. And so that is what we need to continue to do because one role that independent journalists have, um, which is one that I try to play sometimes as a foreign, uh, as foreign correspondent here in Washington, D.C., is um, to, to, we help shape the narrative. That is one purpose of the media and to express ourselves uh, freely. Uh, in the press. And I, I encourage uh, uh, journalists to continue to do that, including young journalists, because as you can see, what has happened to Hopal and others, and remember, Hopal is not the only one. Before Hopal was arrested, 
Uh, many journalists uh, in Zimbabwe in the last uh, few months, uh, just this year, had already been uh, harassed, beaten by soldiers, stopped at roadblocks, um, and, and, and arbitrarily arrested and detained. The, the fact that we are now talking about Hopewell, we have forgotten all the other journalists just this year in 2020 who already went through egregious human rights violations. And, and so we, we may be focusing on Hopewell and forgetting all the other journalists, independent journalists, and many of them young, who, who had already been harassed in Zimbabwe. So I think we must continue to hold truth to power, not just inside Zimbabwe, but to the international community. Uh, rejoice, um, you're part of the civil society, and I guess such you know crisis as, as we have at our hand in Zimbabwe requires um, reinforced efforts from the civil society, think tanks, um, advocacy groups, and you're part of that um, you know of uh, group. So what do you think the civil society needs to do more uh, to bring this problem to an end in Zimbabwe? And um, what would you advise that they do better? Right, thanks. You know, you see, civil society always have if I'm a big role to play in an authoritarian regime like this because they they represent the grassroots. They represent the they represent the individuals that have no voice on their own. So the civil society was very much involved in in the constitution making process. So it is very important because we have to legitimize our struggle against uh, against this, this regime. Once we you step out of the constitutional uh, uh, paradigm. Then Munangagwa is a good reason to, to, to repress, to repress you further. Because remember, even the judiciary is not on our side anymore. We, you know, there's such a blurred line between, you know, the executive and judiciary. So, so it's important that, uh, you know, the, the civil society, they, they bring, they come together under one mission. That is the mission to bring this government back to constitutionalism. And once that, that, uh, that, uh, that critical leverage is done, then you 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 put some 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 value some economic value uh, into the struggle because there must be a way of associating bad governance and economic livelihoods. Because right now the, the government, uh, as Pell says, it shapes the narrative that uh, the reason why we are starving, uh, the reason why we have no electricity and so forth, is because of the sanctions. Now, so so, so once civil society uses this, its representation on the on the ground, the grassroots to to reshape the narrative. That uh, bad governance and bad political choices are the ones responsible for safeguarding the interests of this government. It is then possible uh, to, for for the, for global pressure and static pressure to, to come in. Because as long as civil society is divided, it is becomes very impossible to to unite under one banner. So so my humble uh, you know position, Ibrahim, is that civil society should come together and bend around the return to constitutionalism. In that case. Uh, then it is easy for us to identify a, a mandate. And I want to thank you um, guys for, for taking the time to, to join us for the discussion today. And it's been an amazing um, session with you. And um, I hope we can continue the discussion on Twitter and go back to the field to play our active roles in bringing things to, to Zimbabwe. Thank you.